the coast of Britain in a ship to evade um, uh, 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 being shut down by the authorities and broadcast um, from the, um, uh, from the um, uh, British Channel. There's that um, rather uh, Hugh Grant type of m m movie that has just come out a couple of years ago called The Boat That Rocked about um, that uh, uh, alternative um, uh, pirate radio um, scene. And you get the emergence of the free festivals and concerts movement. So, you know, you have Woodstock, obviously, in the U.S. in 1969. Um, uh, in 1970, you get the launch of, of the Glastonbury um, uh, Festival in, um, in the s southwest of England, and then a whole series of other free festivals that were much more, more uh, small-scale and popped up all around the country. And here's a, just a flyer um, to demonstrate, you know, how, um, you know, this is from April to August and they're just basically open sites that people would um, uh, pitch up um, to attend. Oh, this really pains me. That well, sometimes when... Uh, I'll post this on B-Space, but it's a, it's, a, it's a trailer of a film that two very famous um, uh, uh, film producers and film directors made about the Glastonbury Festival in 1971. Um, and I'll put a link up uh, on B-Space for you because I don't have time to show it. Um, the, I have to do this because this is another one of my heroes. Um, so I have, to, I have to talk about him rather than um, let you watch the thing about Glastonbury. Um, one of the key figures on Radio 1 for alternative or independent music as it was beginning to be called was John Peel. John Peel had... Um, not worked on pirate radio. He'd come over to the US and then got a job in the BBC on Radio 1 in the late 1960s to basically play the type of independent music that the mainstream disc jockeys were not playing during the day on Radio 1. From the early 70s through to his death a few years ago, his radio show, which was broadcast between 10 o'clock at night and 12 o'clock at night was the place that every indie band wanted to be played. John Peel discovered just about every hit band that you can think of in the UK, from Mark Bolan um, uh, in the um, uh, late 60s through all the uh, punk bands and post-punk bands of the, of the, of the um, late 70s and 80s through to um, uh, 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 trip-hop and everything in the 80s and uh, 1990s. Alongside Peel's broadcasting on Radio 1, um, you have the emergence of new independent record labels, just as you have pirate radio and, and, and the sort of indie scene developing, so you have new record labels again trying to break away out of the establishment forms of the big monopoly of EMI and, and, uh, and Decca and the you know, the great examples of Island Record that starts really, really early and basically brings, is famous for bringing reggae uh, to the UK, a uh, rough trade in 1976, and factory records in 1978. The point that I want to make about this very briefly about, uh, 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 is that in many ways you can see John Peel as recreating the type of BBC ethic of public service broadcasting. In other words, what he was trying to do was to educate listeners not to follow their popular um, choices. That is to say, he thought that people should be taught what it is that they should want to listen to, that he would push the boundaries. So in many ways, John Peel provides a new type of cultural elitism, just as Sir John Reith, the founder of the BBC, wanted um, broadcasters to do. You know, he's, a, he's a hero for people of my generation, but he's also very, very much in that BBC uh, tradition of sort of paternalist broadcasting. Okay, two minutes to go, um, and um, uh, a quick recap. So the first point that I want to emphasize is that this is not a lecture about the 1960s as a decade. One of the things I've been trying to do um, is show that there are a whole series of earlier 
forms of change that were happening in the 1950s and that the 60s happened in a very slow and uneven type of way across different types of areas. So student politics happens in the late 1960s. Feminist politics happens in the late 70s. But, you know, the musical youth scene happens in the early 1960s, etc., etc., etc. One could also say that it's uneven geographically. That is to say that that w idea of, you know, the swinging 60s is something that was basically confined to, um, uh, to London and just to a very small set of the population of London. I've also been trying to make the point that the 60s was provided both a critique of the paternalism of welfare capitalism and the old sort of elitist will tell you what to read, will tell you how to do politics, etc., etc., but that it reinscribed a different type of paternalism. The whole idea of an alternative counterculture, rather like John Peel, was rooted in the idea that these people knew what cultural form was really appropriate, how you really become a better person through a different type of cultural practice. And I've also been trying to suggest to you that that counterculture was often the product of commercialism, yeah? that it was often presented as an alternative to commercialism, but actually um, it was frequently a product of it, and I think music is a fine example um, of that. And then very finally, the point that I've been edging to around, because we're going to come to it next week big time, is the idea of how far the new set of political possibilities that occur around increasing forms of identity politics was orientated towards transforming social democracy, transforming society as a whole, or replacing it with a series of much more discrete types of um, forms of self-emancipation. Basically, whether the 60s leads to a, a radicalization of social democracy or its displacement by a new type of individualism, by an individual set of consumer choices and paths um, of uh, emancipation. And my huge apologies um, for having so much material and so little time. I'll be better next week, I promise.